Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to have you here today. We're so excited you're with us, not only those who are joining us right here in this auditorium, but we have our church family joining us today from Utah, New Mexico, Orlando, Florida, Los Angeles, all over the county, Latvia, Sweden, Switzerland. Come on, welcome our church family that's joining us online. Isn't that great? Wow, there's been a lot happen already. We've had some graduations, some worships, some salvation. And now we're going to get into the Word. You know, before we dive in, if you have your Bible, your phone, wherever you're getting your source of Scripture, if you want to follow along live notes, download the Higher Vision app and you'll see that. You can follow along. I like to start with something funny. Um, I heard the story about this little six-year-old boy who was out in the lobby of his church looking at this large plaque. On the plaque were names and next to the names were an American flag. He had kind of a puzzled look and so he looked over to the pastor and he said, um, what do all of these names with the American flag next to them mean? Well, the pastor looked at the young boy and he said, well, son, this is a memorial to remember all the young men and young women who died in the service. The little boy stood there for a couple of minutes, kind of a weird look on his face and said, was it the 1030 service or the 11 a.m.? <laughs> How many know you're glad you're in the right service? Come on, somebody say hey, amen. Hey, this is a... Yeah, okay. I want you to stand to your feet today. <laughs> We're going to dive right into a new message today, and it may carry on next week. I don't know. I, I, I felt like we need to talk about the theme forward. And I felt led to do that because of what was happening this weekend, that we're, we're in a season where people are graduating and they're taking a step into the new season. How many know that God has new seasons for us? How many know that God does new things? And so if we're going to talk about going forward, then we need to go to this passage of Scripture that's found in Philippians. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, your phones, to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. As we, we look at this passage, if you're going to talk about going forward, this is a passage that I think is a great summary of what that looks like. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read, and you're standing to honor the reading of God's Word. But at one point, I'm going to ask you to read with me, because there's a little bit of reading today. So just follow along here at the beginning. Paul is speaking to the Philippian church. Chapter 3 verse 12 says, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. In other words, there's one thing as Christians that we should be focusing on. I want you to read with me now, everyone loudly. Let me hear you strong. You ready? Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Now we're going to try that again because this is the focus. This is the one thing that we should be doing, we should be focusing on as Christians. Let's try it again together. The one thing is what? Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Now I'll continue. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. You realize God is calling you forward. It's not just something that's a good idea. God is calling you forward. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. I love this part. And if you disagree at some point, I believe God is going to make it plain. But we must, what's the next two words? Hold on to the progress we have already made. Do you realize that spiritually mature people know that they have to move forward? You can't stay where you are because mature people understand that God is calling us forward. How many want to step forward into everything that God has for you? Come on, wave at me. All right, now close your eyes. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We say, have your way in this place. Take us forward. Say that with me. Say, God, take me forward. I'm tired of being stuck. I'm ready to move forward. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. 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 You may be seated today. Thank you, Jake. So God's called us forward. Spiritually mature people move forward. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to take this passage and we're going to learn three things that I think this passage is teaching us when it comes to moving forward. So the first point, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, and that is that God is looking 
for forward progress. Everybody say that with me. Forward progress. God wants us to move forward, and that is forward progress. Now, what does forward progress mean? Well, let me just say, first of all, is that um, what God's saying is that don't just go through the motions. Don't just stay where you are, but you need to move forward. You need to progress. You need to see progress. And here's why, because of this quote, and it's simply this, change is inevitable, but progress is a choice. Change is inevitable, it's going to happen, but progress is a choice. I don't know about you, but I have to have a sense of progress to stick with something. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If I'm going to stick with something, I need to feel like I'm progressing. Let's, let's take an example. How many here have ever decided to go on a diet? How I many you know if you're on a diet, if, you know, three days, and what do you do? Hopefully, you're getting on the scale every morning, right? And you get off, or at least every two or three days, you're getting on the scale. Why? Because you get on the scale hoping that after three days or five days, the needle is going to move. But how many of you figured out that if after a week or two weeks, there's no moving of the needle or there's no progress, it's like, give me that burger. Come on, I'm ready for some fries. Because if I'm not progressing, I'm not going to be fulfilled enough to stick with the process. I want to tell you that in your business, in your marriage, as you pursue your degree, in your ministry, you're not going to be fulfilled in life if you don't realize that there's progress taking place in your journey. So one of the passages that we read here is it tells us that we need to be people who are going forward, but what is it that we're doing? We're having forward progress. In fact, I want to go back to uh, this last part of the verse that we read. Philippians 3.16 says, but we must, what's the next two words? Hold on to the what? Progress we've already made. Let me ask you a question. How many are thankful that you've made some progress? How many are thankful that you're not what you used to be? And let me say, I may not be what I want to be, but praise God, I'm not what it used to be. Somebody say amen to that. Because we've made progress. We're in a different place. Some of you used to be bound, but now you are free. Amen? You've made progress. Some of you had no relationship with God. You weren't in church. You didn't have relationship, but now you're following Jesus on your way to heaven. Somebody say amen for progress. But here's what God says to us about progress. We need to have forward progress and we need to hold on to the progress we made because here's the thing. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. Come on, just throw a little. We need progress, but here's what God says. You're gonna have to hold on to it. You can't just go through the motions. You can't just check off the boxes that I went to church 35 times out of 52. I'm doing good. No, you've got to have progress. And God says you've got to hold on to it. And here's what's interesting. It's going to give us a little insight on how, how many would like to know how to hold on to the progress you have already? Did you know what's interesting? The word says there, hold on to the progress that you have made. The word hold on in the Greek there, it means this. And this is really insightful. It means to be in proper battle formation with other soldiers, to stay in formation. So the picture is, if you've ever seen a, a, a battle array, or you've seen soldiers marching, right, and they're with other soldiers, and, and the soldiers move, and then they move, and the, everyone's in place, and you don't get out of place, you don't leave the line, you don't get out of formation. In other words, you know, our theme this year, this really is an example of our theme, because our theme for the year is together. And all year we've been talking about being together, together in prayer, together in vision, right? Together in generosity, together in rescuing the lost. We've talked about all these things, right? And we've learned that when we get together in unity, the Bible says that how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity because that's where God commanded the blessing. Anybody want to be in the middle of the commanded blessing? Do you realize that the only way you're going to hold on to your progress that you've already made is to be in a circle, to be in a community, to be connected and committed to your local church, brothers and sisters, and be in step. 
Because it's together that we hold on to the progress we made. And I got to tell you, as a pastor, I see it over and over again. It's the people that go, well, you know, I don't really need to be in a small group. Yeah, you know, I don't really need to, to go to church that much. You know, twice a month is good for me. And pretty soon you see them begin to wander farther and farther away from the, the formation that God has created to help you and I to be strong. What does the Bible say? Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We need people around us to help us stay in formation so that we can hold on to the progress that we've made made amen it's good preaching good preaching pastor jared we need to move forward right we need to have forward progress and that means we need each other that's why every week you see a circle on the announcements that's why every week you hear me talking about together why would we do that i'm not trying to make you feel bad i'm not trying to just nudge you and I'm not trying to just push you I'm just wanting you to hold on to the progress that you've already made. Somebody say amen. amen. So we have to have forward progress. And then this is the second thing that we find in this passage. We have to have forward effort. We have to have forward effort. If you go back to Philippians chapter 3, here's what it tells us. It says, I what? I press. I press on to what? To possess. So I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. It's interesting because the word press on is a Greek word which means to aggressively pursue. It means to chase like a hunter. It means to desire to overtake. The analogy in the next verse when he says, I, I move forward like I'm on a race, it's really like a, a person who's in the middle of a, a race and you've seen them in the Olympics, right? And they're running around the track and at the end, they are, they're going, I mean, there's effort, passion, right? They're, they're all in, their necks are straining and they're pressing to get to the finish line. The point simply I want to make is that there is no forward progress without effort. You have to put effort into moving forward. Let's go, let's go back to our analogy of the diet. I, I'll just explain it this way. How many know that you can't burn off what you're unmotivated to move? Come on, that's funny, kind of. I mean, <laughs> some of us are good at moving certain parts of our body. One, two, three, Four, and we've got people around us going, go, 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 one, two, right? We move certain parts, but we're not going to burn off what we're unmotivated to move. In other words, you won't start the diet, you won't build the business, you won't finish the degree, you won't get out of debt without effort. Because God is looking for people who will press. Now, I know first, first thing you're thinking, some of you, is, well, wait a minute, Pastor, are you talking about legalism? Are you telling me that I have to work for my salvation? I have to work for all this stuff? What, what are you trying to say? Is God legalistic? And if we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and we do this, it's all about what I do and what I do. Listen, I'm not teaching legalism today. In fact, what's interesting is Paul, in this passage, and there's another passage where Paul is talking to his spiritual son, and he addresses this issue completely. He says in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, here's what he tells his, his son. Do not neglect your spiritual gift you received. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your what? Right. See, we're saved through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're going to go to heaven if we have faith in Christ. But let me tell you something. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you possess every promise that God has for you. The children of Israel came out of Egypt and were taken to the promised land, but God didn't give them the promised land. He said, you go and you use effort and force and you take it. And so God's not teaching legalism here. What he's teaching is people who won't just sit back and hope that everything happens. People that sit back and say, well, maybe next year things will change. Maybe next year I'll grow. Maybe next year my kids will really serve the Lord. Maybe next year I'll start giving. Maybe next year I'll get involved in that ministry. Maybe next year I'll start a diet. No, what God is saying is that we're people who have a passion that say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to progress. I'm going to hold on to where I am, but I'm going to put a little effort. I'm going to put a little power. I'm going to put 
put a little passion because God has called me forward. And what I love is he says that when you put effort, you will possess that thing through which Christ possessed you. You know what the word possess means in the Greek? It means to lay hold of and seize with effort. In other words, you'll never grasp all of the promises that are before you without effort. And what I love is that it goes on to say, and you're going to possess, and he, he gives an example of how Christ possessed you. And guess what? It's the same exact word. Do you realize that God seized you with effort? He looked at the world and he said, the world is lost and they, they need to be saved. So he looks at his son and he says, listen, we need to save the world. And Jesus, he said, I want to use you. And Jesus is like, okay, tell me what to do. Do I just shoot a lightning bolt? He says, no, 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 you're going to have to put some effort in. You're going to leave heaven. And you're, go, you're going to go be born in a barn. And then when you're born, you're going to be running from nation and city to, because people are going to be trying to kill you. And then finally, when you get old enough to have your own ministry, you're going to start teaching people about my love. And when that happens, people are going to come against you and they're going to mock you and they're going to try to trip you up. And eventually, they're going to arrest you. But before you get arrested, what does the Bible say? He was in the garden and he had so much effort and passion into possessing you and me that his pores were pouring out blood with his sweat until eventually he died and then he rose again. Why? Why? so that he could possess you and possess me. Aren't you thankful for effort? We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for effort. So God is looking for people who, number one, have forward progress, and number two, who are willing to have forward effort. And the third thing you need to write down is that God is looking for people who will have forward, what's the next word? Vision. Vision. Forward vision. So let's take a look at the passage in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 says, but I focus on this one thing. This is the big thing. What is it? And he gives us a couple of ideas here. He says, first of all, what's these words? Say it with me. Ready? Forgetting so forgetting the past, and then we are to forget the past, and tell me the next. Looking forward. Looking forward to what lies ahead. In other words, our vision is forward, not backwards. We have forward vision because in order to go forward, in order to receive every promise, there has to be effort, but there has to be vision. Let me just say it this way. I love this idea. And that is effort plus direction equals progress. Effort plus, now this is a big one, Direction equals progress. Here's a question for you. Where are you headed with your kids? Where are you headed with your business? Where are you headed spiritually? Where are you headed physically? Because it's not just passion that will change things. But it's direction with passion. It's direction with effort. And it's interesting because when he talks about forward vision, he starts by addressing the past. And he says, forgetting the past. I took a look at that word in the Greek, and that word in the Greek, um, it means this. It means to dismiss. To forget means, listen to this, it's pretty interesting, to dismiss from the mind. And then it says this, to stop remembering. So in other words, moving forward is about making a decision to not remember. But the problem is, I mean, you know, too many times we try to step forward, but we, every time we step forward, we pull the past in with us. I started thinking about this issue of why is it that Paul said if you're going to move forward and have forward vision, you need to forget the past. And I came up with two reasons, and I want to give them to you. Here's the first reason. The first reason that we need to forget the past is because he doesn't want us to keep focusing on our failures and on our mistakes. 
How many times we're ready to step into something new? Maybe you, you felt God stirring you to get involved and say, hey, I'm going to start serving in 2017 and do something for the Lord. But then as you're about ready to go sign up and get that volunteer packet, suddenly you remember the last time you were in church and what happened there and how the goofy people acted weird and you got hurt. And so you're about to take a step. But now what happens? You pull the past into your present because rather than looking forward, you're looking backwards. And because of past failures, now you can't move into your present forward or into your future or sometimes it's just simply the shame what if somebody finds out see God's saying to move forward you got to forget you got to choose to say I- I'm not going to focus on the past because here's the thing I've said it before but if you don't let go of the past the past won't let go of you so sometimes I think Paul is telling us we need to forget the past because You don't need to pull those past mistakes into your future. Here's the other thing, though. This is the one I think that we forget. and This is the one that we don't focus on. I think this is even bigger than that. And I think the reason that that Paul says, I don't want you to keep looking at the past. I want you to forget it. Is because it's not just about your failures, but here's what he wants. He wants to keep you from focusing on your past victories. Somebody say, what's so bad about that? Come on, let me ask you a question. How many of you have met people that are still living in the good old days? Come on. You know what I'm talking about? They're still living in the good old days. They still got it. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? And you start talking to them and in the conversation, suddenly, somehow it comes up how that when they were in high school, they had the fastest record. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? They're still living in the good old days. And the point I'm making is it could it be that God is saying, listen, I don't want you to focus on the past because I don't want you to focus on your mistakes and your failures, but instead he's saying, I don't want you to focus on the past because in the past you had some victories and you had some strategy that you used in the past, but when you try to use that same strategy in your future, it's not going to work because I'm a God who does the new thing. And too many times... We're bringing the past strategies and focuses into the present and we wonder why we can't break through and we wonder why things don't change and it's because we keep reliving the old strategies, the old plans and we keep living in the good old days. I'm gonna tell you something. God is a God of the new and he wants to do something new in you. Somebody say amen. I'll give you an example in the Bible. Let me ask you a question. How many of you felt like when you read the story about Moses and how he brought the people out of Israel and he took them towards the promised land and then Moses makes a mistake and doesn't get to go into the promised land. How many are like, that's not fair. Come on, when you read the story. Are you like me? I'm like, really God, come on. I mean, he put up with all two million complainers for 40 years. He deserves to go into his future. So let's look at that story because that story shows us this passage in Philippians. Because what happens is they end up in a part of the wilderness where there's no water. And so they come to Moses and they start complaining, we're thirsty, we're thirsty, we need some water, we need some water. You just wonder if they were all children. Come on. (laughs) And so Moses is like, okay, okay, let me see. And he goes to God, he says, God, what should I do? And God says, see that rock over there? Speak to the rock and you'll give them water. And so what does Moses do? He comes over and he says, okay, guys, come here. And he grabs his staff and he hits the rock. And he hits the rock and nothing happens. So what does he do? He hits the rock again. I mean, here, have you ever had that energy? If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And so he hits again and then suddenly, boom, water comes out. People start drinking the water and then God says, you disobeyed you're not going into the promised land. It's like, bummer. But what we don't know is that there's really more to this story than it's at the the, the, the surface level. Because what happened was is that there was another time, if you read through the story, that the children of Israel were in a place where there was no water. And when they got to this place where there was no water, uh, Moses came to God and said, they want something to drink, what am I supposed to do? And watch what God says. Grab your stick and strike the rock. And he strikes the rock and water comes out and everybody drinks and everything's fine. Now fast forward to the the new story. What did Moses do? 
instead of listening to the Lord so that he could step into his future, he pulled the past, he took the old, he walked in the old strategy in the old way. Well, if you talk to your kids this way, if you use the power of the, the laying on of hands, whatever it might be, this is the way I did it. This is the way it worked before. This is how we're supposed to do it. And if we're not careful, we can't step into our forward promise and blessing that God has for us because we keep looking to the past and pulling all the stuff from the past into our present. It's time to let go of the past so that the past can let go of you. Somebody say amen. Maybe the biggest hindrance from you stepping into your promised land is not your past failures. It's your past victories. Because you're still living in the strategies of the past. And God says, I want to do a new thing. That's good preaching. Somebody say amen. That's good preaching. See, God wants us to come to a place, and I wish I could preach on that story of, of, of Moses because there's so much in there. Because God afterwards, he says, you didn't honor me in front of the children of Israel. You see, I think, and, and I'm just kind of going off now the cuff. This is in my notes, just feeling led here, so we'll just take a little minute and go down the rabbit trail, okay? God's more concerned about honor than he is about strategy. And when God said, I want you to honor me and do it this way, when you and I don't honor him and don't listen and don't obey, and we go back to the old strategies of the past, what we're saying is, God, I don't trust you. What we're saying is, God, I don't listen to you. I do it my way. God was concerned not about the strategy, but about the honor. And when you and I do it his way, when we learn to get a vision for the future and we get a strategy for the future, what we're doing is we're giving glory and honor to God. You realize that's why we were created, to give glory and honor to the Lord. And we're diminishing his glory by focusing on the past, whether it's past failures or whether it's past victories. God is saying, listen, I want you to honor me. I want you to, to give glory to, to me through the things that you do and the things you say. So quit focusing behind and have forward vision. Somebody say amen. So let's go to that part of the, the, the passage. We go back to Philippians chapter 3. It says, I focus on this one thing. One thing. Everybody say one thing. Come on, wave at me. Say one thing. Okay, I'm just trying to get you to remember this one thing. Because if there's one thing that you leave with today, one thing, this is the thing I hope you leave with, this one thing. What does it say? Let's try that again. Okay, I want to hear the online campus now. Ready, online campus? Thank you. It's really good. It's good. Heard you all the way through the camera. Looking forward to receive the prize. Receive the prize. You have to look forward because it's not just effort, but it's effort plus direction equals progress. But here's the problem. A lot of us struggle looking forward, and I'll explain here in a minute, because we don't really know where forward is. I'll give you an example. How many know that when you're lost, what do you do? You go to your GPS on your phone because it knows. It has the satellites that are positioned around the earth. And when you go to your, your, your phone and you look on there, it tells you which way to go. It tells you where forward is. Now, sometimes I'm in a situation where I don't know where forward is. And if my phone isn't working, I have my own personal private GPS. And her name is Devet Ming. She's in this service. And I'm telling you, Devet is incredible at ama and amazing at so many things. And there's one thing that she is as consistent at as anything, and that is if we are asking which way to go, and I ask her, and she decides it's that way, every time it's that way. 
So if I'm trying to figure out where to go, I'm not lying, I'll say, and I don't have my phone, I'll say, which way to go, babe? And she'll be like, and I'll be like, okay, let's go. <laughs> and it's always right. It happened last Saturday. We were at this place and we had to go to an orientation and we get out of the car and I'm thinking, which way to go? And I had one of those moments where I just, I was weak and I was tempted. Come on, how many have ever had those moments? And I was tempted and I'm like, I'm not sure which way. She goes, I think it's that way. And I'm like, okay, so here's what we did. <laughs> the point I'm making is simply this. You can't move forward if you don't know which way is forward. And a lot of people, when it comes to progress, when it comes to moving into the visions and dreams that they have for their lives, the problem is they just don't know which way is forward. Well, I think I'm supposed to, to invest in this. I think I'm supposed to start this, this new business. I think we should go to that school. I think I should get on isogenics. I think, I think, I think, I think. The problem is we live our lives and we don't know which way forward is. And yet God is calling us forward and mature people move forward. So today, how do we figure out forward? How many would like to figure that out? Okay, I'll show you one interesting thing. This verse sums up this whole passage in Philippians. It's found in the book of Proverbs. It says, where there is no what? Vision. Where there is no what? Vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Now, this verse right here has two words that I want to focus on. First, vision. Second, perish. How many would like to stay away from the perish part? Yeah, I would too. The word vision doesn't mean to see, and that's where we live. We live on the realm of just seeing. But the word vision means divine revelation, divine guidance. So forward is connected to catching a glimpse, or let me say it this way, really creative, a higher vision You know what our vision is, why we're here is to help people find God's vision for their life. In other words, we get a revelation and we begin to see through God's eyes. We begin to see the unveiled truth, uh, wisdom, direction, and guidance we need so that we can step into God's design and purpose for our lives. So where people have God vision or revelation or God guidance in their life, they're blessed. But when people don't know which way forward is, when people are living in their own sight and guessing, the Bible says they perish. Here's what's interesting about the word perish, and it ties into what we've learned already. The word perish means to scatter, to get out of formation. We just learned that if we're going to hold on to our progress, we've got to stay in formation. We've got to stay in relationship. We've got to stay in circles. We've got to stay in community. We've got to stay, right? But the problem is, is people don't stay because they don't have a God vision. They just have a, a good vision. I mean, there's a difference between a good vision and a God vision. So if we're going to hold on to our progress and we're going to stay in formation, we have to look forward with divine revelation, with divine God vision. That's what happened to Saul. Saul thought he was going forward. He was on the way to Damascus. He was locking up Christians. He was doing the good work of people who were heretics. He thought he was going forward. There's a lot of people. What does the scripture say? Man thinks the way that he should go. He knows, but the end leads to death. What is it? He doesn't have forward vision. He doesn't have God revelation vision. He has his vision. He has good vision, not God vision. And God, aren't you thankful that God stepped in the middle of Saul's life and said, hey, bro, you got the wrong vision. You need forward vision. 
suddenly his eyes were opened and he began to see something different and God gave him a new purpose. I'm going to tell you, people that find Jesus and find a higher vision, their purposes and plans start to change. It goes from good to God. And they start to see things differently. They start to see forward. There's a whole new direction. It's a whole different perspective of life. I'll never forget for me, in my own life, I, I thought I had God vision. And I did. I was a worship pastor. Devet and I were serving at a church and all these great things were happening. We had a television ministry that was touching people all over the world. We had a school. In fact, Pastor April was raised up out of that school. We had uh, conferences. I was traveling and teaching. We had choir. We had recordings and songs that were being sung all over the world that we had recorded. And all these good things were going. And I was headed down this road and I thought I was moving forward. And then suddenly on, on a Super Bowl Sunday, 2003, God shows up and he opens my eyes. And he says, hey, that's not forward anymore. This is forward. And here's what he said. You're going to go and plant a church. What? And I'm so thankful that God showed me forward. Because if I hadn't gone forward in the last 12 years, maybe 32,000 people wouldn't have accepted Jesus Christ. If I hadn't gone forward, maybe you wouldn't be here with your testimony, how that you were, like someone told me this week, you were an alcoholic and you were about to lose everything. And now, even though you got a DUI, even though your wife was going to leave you, now your marriage is restored. Now you are involved teaching and sharing your testimony and helping and celebrate freedom. That may not have happened if I hadn't found forward. Who's waiting on the other side of your forward? forward progress, forward effort, and forward vision. So here's the thing. I know what many are thinking right now. We're going to end with this. How do I find forward? How do I find God's vision? I'll give you three ways. You ready? Number one, consistently be in a place where you're receiving Holy Spirit-inspired teaching. That's why you need to be here on the weekends. Whether it's me, Pastor Wayman, one of our pastors that speak, one of our guests that speak, I believe this is a place where God is revealing his word, he's illuminating truth, and you need to be in a place where you're hearing the word of God. Why? Because okay. the word of God is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. It will help you find forward. Keep coming. Sorry. Keep listening. Keep opening your heart. Secondly, you're handsome as ever, though. you need a circle. There you go again, Pastor Jared. You need a place where you can be in formation. Because it's easy to be on the very end of the last line on the farthest row when you just come on Sunday. So you need to be in a circle because that's where we learn, right? If you're going to hold on to your progress, you need accountability, you need relationships, you need people. And then thirdly, you need a divine unveiling. There's a story I'll end with, and, and I, know, I, I know today that, that this may seem like a lot, but remember the story of the, 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 the prophet Elisha? And he's standing on a wall of a city, and next to him is a servant. And as they're standing there, there's an army that have come to, to get him, to defeat the city. And so the servant looks at, at Elisha, he's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? They're here. They're going to kill us. It's over. Ah! And Elisha looks at him and says, oh, don't worry. There are a whole lot more of our warriors than them. And the servant's like, huh? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 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 One, two. And then Elisha says, oh, here's the problem. You don't have divine vision. God, open his eyes suddenly he gets a divine revelation and he starts counting chariots of fire with angels scattered all throughout the mountains. Everything changed because he caught a vision from heaven. And what I'm believing is that today as we pray when we end this service, there are going to be some people that have some eyes opened. 
you're going to see the power and grace of God. You're going to see that God has put you here for a purpose, not just to make money and provide for your family and then die and leave it to them so they can do the same thing and leave it to them, but that maybe God has a divine direction for you that will help you step into a fulfillment and a purpose and a progress and a promise that is definitely called to be yours.